privilege to be um, thinking about teaching on um, even at the weekend. Uh, certainly, my my comments are probably a bit shorter than than I planned on today. I wasn't sure exactly how long sessions were, but maybe that way we can have it a bit be a bit more um, collaborative. Um, as you said, Christy, I'm from uh, Christopher Newport University in um, Newport News, Virginia. Uh, this is my first year here. I teach Spanish. I'm a language person. I'm a, a humanist. And really, my scholarship deals with um, cultural studies of 19th and 20th century Mexico and also literature. Um, so that's to say I'm not. One of the things that I was thinking about is when people... Uh, you know, obviously the motivation for me in, in taking part in this, this conference is learning tricks of the trade about kind of uh, being part of this kind of online environment suddenly, uh, new technology tools, new digital tools, and in a strange way, um, and hopefully this will be a bit of a, a cliffhanger, um, my comments today are certainly not about that at all. Um, let's say that my uh, presentation is distinctly lo-fi. Um, at the current time, my, my kind of talk is called Experts, Argumentation, and Infographics, uh, the Presentation of Self in Online Life. And I, I was looking at some of the, the, the titles of the other sessions today, and, and someone, I forget who, had the title to change or not to change. And I thought that really kind of got at what the present moment is about in terms of how much should instruction change in the on online environment? How much should it stay the same? Um, to what extent do we need to uh, think about technology in order to be uh, part of, of this, this kind of different change world? And certainly, of course, obviously the title of the conference, uh, Pandemic uh, Pedagogies, uh, certainly would lead itself to think that it, everything needs to be uh, technologically driven, digitally uh, savvy. Um, again, my comments today are, uh, I would say that in a certain sense, they can exist inside or outside the digital environment, but it's kind of what I'm working on. And certainly I'd love to hear any kind of um, comments. My background um, is from this place, place I love, my hometown, Chicago, uh, and the University of Chicago. And so a lot of what I'm gonna be talking about today, if you would like to fall down the rabbit hole in terms of thinking about these issues a lot more, I would suggest that you um, check out really the writing program and kind of ways of argumentation. And so uh, today's talk, again, uh, experts, argumentation, and infographics, it's really a confluence of factors. And I think about these, my, my really kind of very simple graphics here, uh, again, uh, lo-fi. Uh, it's really about argumentation, about the presentation of the self, and thinking about this online format or this online world that we're suddenly dealing with. Um, and I would suggest that I think that this kind of, uh, these tools or this kind of way of thinking about the world could be valid, certainly in language classes where I teach, uh, any types of English classes, communications courses. Uh, certainly I have taught these types of tools uh, for high school students and younger students. Um, I think of it as kind of a, a lost art in a certain sense, um, that, but that can be uh, really shared across uh, levels. And I would suggest that, um, I would love for, for, for everyone here to help me think about how it, we can transform this or how this can be put into a more cogent way in the online environment. Obviously, the one part of my triangle here, um, and one part of my title, the presentation of self, hopefully should have, um, should kind of scratch the back of your head, have you think about these things, and, 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 and may, hopefully that's familiar to you everyone here. Uh, this kind of talk about the presentation of the self comes from the mid-century, the 20th century, mid-century, um, a gentleman, a Canadian by the name of Erwin uh, Goffman. And uh, here his, is his most famous book. You can find it readily online. Uh, it's an old, musty classic 
when I bring him up as one of my favorites, uh, even amongst my sociolo- sociology friends, uh, they kind of scratch their chin a bit and think, who is this? How is this happening that, that, that you're still talking about Goffman so many years later, um, over 70 years later almost? Um, but this is one of his main points. He says the self is not an organic thing that has a specific location whose fundamental fate is to be born, to mature, to die. It is a dramatic effect arising diffusely from a scene that is presented. And so I got into Goffman actually out of necessity in a certain sense, Um, a bit more back narrative, I guess. I was on the academic market, which we all know is very, very difficult. Um, I certainly think over the last seven years, I've applied to perhaps a a thousand jobs, Um, but I'm very thankful to be where I am now. Now, Um, during that time, during that time of looking for a job, uh, my PhD advisor uh, suggested while I was trying to polish my image, uh, make sure I uh, put on a tie before talking to people, making sure I put the right rhythm in my tone of in my in my uh, presentation, uh, thinking about my Chicago accent that I need to kind of still get rid of. Uh, she suggested, and I think very well uh, put, she suggested that I look into Goffman in the presentation of the self. And I got very interested into this, uh, into this book, and it got even more interesting after this year of pandemic uh, pedagogy. Uh, that's to say that in an online format, suddenly when identity and how one presents oneself to the rest of the world becomes uh, obscured, becomes different. Um, when things happen slower in an online environment, when things have to be more, um, we'll say, uh, concise in a certain way and precise and intentional, I think would be the right word. What does that look like? How does one present oneself? Um, a bit more about Goffman, you know. Um, He was a Canadian sociologist who understood that human action uh, is by seeing people as actors on a social stage uh, and who actively create an impression of themselves for the benefit of the audience. Uh, He studied face-to-face interaction. Um, So I thought that was interesting, right? In the sense that suddenly we aren't face-to-face. How does Goffman's, how do the the truths of Goffman, uh, how are they translated into an online environment? And if I'm like anyone else here, perhaps um, we could say that some of my students as the previous speaker, um, Amber noted, um, some students have been really struggling with the online environment. I have also found the opposite to be true, that some students have been very much receptive to the online environment. Um, That's to say that the online interface has become kind of a second or even a first mask. That is, I I think is Goffman's point what is how one presents oneself to the world. So now that we have this online environment, how does that happen? If we're being more intentional, if things are happening with a bit of a lag, um, what does the online environment look like if we think about, uh, we have to present the, present the self? As a final note, I would say about Goffman is the fact that, um, you know, we don't wanna think about Goffman as uh, telling us to be liars, telling us to, to be duplicitous, telling us to be false to other people. Rather, it's how to polish one Im- polish one's image and, and kind of express what one wants to express um, via their, 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 their social self um, and, how, and how, to, how to get what they want out of life in, in, in the kind of best sense of the term. Again, some of the things I'm thinking about here come from the University of Chicago, and of course, their writing program is called the Little Red Schoolhouse. And so my comments are going to be kind of directly related to that. How do we render the strengths of the Little Red Schoolhouse into the academic, uh, into the, the, the classroom, have students think about argumentation a lot more serious way, and also think about their online persona um, and have a real sense about who one is. Um, during these kind of very difficult times. Um, A lot of my comments too are also from the craft of research. Um, 
thinking about the the University of Chicago, if you want to follow up on some of the, the categories of analysis, you can think about the craft of research as a kind of um, touchstone book uh, looking ahead. How about this? We have quite a bit of time. And so why don't we do this? I'm going to put up uh, the next screen. And I would love if people could type into the chat if you are listening. And certainly I hope that you are. Um, I think that is allowed. And, and Christy, please tell me otherwise if it is not. Um, but here is kind of a set of words. Um, how about this? Why don't everyone choose three, or at least those that are listening, those that are out there. I love you for to you choose three of these when thinking about your work, when thinking about student work, when thinking about essays that you would like to write, when thinking about what you'd like your students to write, whether that be about language, whether that be about history, whether that be about whatever they're writing about, what three things should they shoot for as they, um, as they write? And how about I give you guys one minute? I'll put on my timer here. Um, and I'd love to hear what, what people think if that's, if that's appropriate. Maybe choose three. Absolutely. Choose Everyone three. Good, good, good. No, I'd love to, love to see what, what people think about. Good. This is great. These are great responses. These are fabulous, fabulous responses. So um, I chose thoughtful, organized, and useful because I feel like if I'm going to read someone's paper, yeah. Um, I would want it to be first organized. I don't want to get lost in your thoughts. Um, I want it to be useful to me, gain something from it. And then also I want to come out of it with either like a question or come out of it with something to make me want to keep um, learning about whatever it is like the topic was, if that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you so much. This is, this is Lindsay Byer. Thank you for, 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 for telling you, I, I like the first two, thought organized and useful. Good, good. A lot of people choose organized. A lot of people choose organized, the British spelling, that's that's fine too. Um, there's no right, I mean, thank you for chiming in, Lindsay. I, pre I appreciate that. Um, I think if we were to listen to the, the, the kind of, the, the again, think about the Little Red Schoolhouse of the University of Chicago as a toolkit, I think um, we would agree mostly on useful um in terms of what is it asking you to do as the reader um there is ultimately no correct answer for these i certainly don't know the right answer but i really like just asking this using the simple activity to kind of warm up students um we'll do one more quick thing here here's another set of words take one minute give me the three words here and let's see if for this it's it's a bit more uh, I have a bit more to say about which words are, we won't say correct, but say more compelling. So take one other minute and I will put on my uh, clock here. And again, Lindsay, thank you for, for, for chiming in. I mean, I suppose it depends also on the genre. I suppose it depends on the genre, um, expository narrative. Again, I'm trying to prepare my students to, to kind of make kind of college level arguments, right? Um, that at least maybe won't be published, but at least would point to um, a publication, at least a, a, the, the, the kernel of an idea for a publication, right? Um, a lot of people say analyze, I like that. That feels kind of sciency to me. Um, you know, I suspect that if we were talking to the Little Red Schoolhouse, again, this kind of uh, toolkit of um, categories of analysis that one can use in order to uh, produce kind of cogent or compelling academic writing, uh, I would say that we would kind of shy away from something like summarize. Um, we might get closer to criticize, argue. We might get away a bit of a, from assess or examine, but certainly types of persuasion, right? Certainly types of persuasion. That's to say, if there's not a problem, there's not a thesis. There's not a problem, there's not a thesis. If there's not a problem that you can say yes or no, um, there is no argument, right? How does this happen in the online environment? I want this definitely, I think we have something else to say. Let's try to keep this interactive still. You're the expert. Again, thinking about this moment that, of course, 
uh, Professor Amber just talked about in the, the, the plenary session, this moment that kind of um, brings out a lot of neuroses in students. And certainly I think we've all seen that um, in our students. Uh, anxiety is still quite high. The fact that I'm teaching um, language, uh, masked um, students are now getting sick, not with COVID per se, but rather just the common cold, but that's also anxiety inducing. I want you to feel good about yourselves today. And so this is what I, I agree with, with Amber and her assessment that, that we need to be not coddling our students, but actually, you know, give, make, make them feel welcome. I want everyone to think about what they're an expert is in today. Um, something that you can feel good about. You can pat yourself on your back. It can be as mundane as you would like it. It can't do, let's say we can't do anything about language. We all know that we're language experts. It can't do about teaching. Um, anything at all, anything that makes you feel good, whether that be dusting your house, whether that be using leftovers, the mundane tasks of the everyday, um, something that you're really good at, that no one else maybe knows about you, um, those kind of quiet moments in the day, singing in the shower maybe, um, something appropriate but also um, simple. And so I'll give you guys one minute to, to make that happen. And we'll see if we can get any, any interesting answer, anything at all. <laughs> Thank you, Lindsay. <laughs> These are awesome responses. We need to meet in person, obviously. I'm horrible at Monopoly. I'm absolutely horrible. I would like to know your secrets, um, may maybe at some future time, but I'm after school naps. I, that's a great, another great, thank you. Thank you, Jenna Rose. I'm an expert in after school naps. I suppose I, I, that's, I, sometimes I don't even get home to take the after school nap. I just collapse on my desk. So that's, that's there too, so. Uh, maybe one more, any, any other thing expert? It's not as easy as it sounds, but again, something to pat yourself on the back. Budget planning, oof, that's, that's getting into the level of, of, of specialization. That's okay, I'm an expert in eating. That's fine with me. That's fine with me, Mauricio. That's absolutely fine. You can totally be an expert in eating. <laughs> Chris. Thank you, Christy. I agree. I can sleep anywhere too. Uh, many times in airports, cars, anywhere at all. Good. So tell me the, so I guess the next step, we have some really good answers there. I guess the question that we have now, going back to, to kind of the expert, we love this term expert in America, and I'm not sure about, or in the United States, I'm not sure if it's terribly appropriate. Um, what do you know that other people don't know? What do you know that other people don't know? And so that's what I would ask my students to do. What are you an expert in? What do you know that others don't know? What is the secret to your success? At that time, then we could either go around the classroom and share, kind of go station to station. We could do breakout rooms. Um, but the, the point would be to ask follow-up questions. What does the expert know that we don't know? And why is that a truth? So I don't know, uh, Jenna Rowe, if I, if I can call on people again, not to be completely um, strange for an online environment. Um, the monopoly thing is obviously interesting. I'd like to know what you know that others don't, Lindsay. I'd love to know about after school naps, Jenna Rose, uh, what you know about after school naps. What is the secret to your success? And we can just write it in the secret to your success. Or even Mauricio, eating. What do you know about eating that others don't know? I think for me, it's too much to write. So I'm going to say it. Um, the secret to my success in Monopoly <laughs> yeah. is um, partly a little, uh, a little trash talking, right? Throw people off their game, okay? Um, coming to the game and already claiming that I'm going to win makes people like, oh, okay, she knows what she's doing. So I'm like completely bluffing the entire time. And then I just, I don't know, I just wing it the entire time. It's interesting. <laughs> uh, trash talking, expressing yourself. This is all, 
I, I will never play against you. That's true. That will, I, I, I'm, I'm very, very concerned, but um, I think those are all great. Um, absolutely. That, that points to argument. Yeah. Uh, th no, thank you for that, Lindsay. Christy says, uh, being able to tune out the world as well as being mindful and self-aware. Interesting. So maybe people don't understand how self-aware. Yeah, that's good. Um, <laughs> a gel mattress topper. <laughs> as unique. Interesting. Now we're getting, that's, that's a really interesting point too, Mauricio. I like that. I like that. I like that. Um, so now we're pointing at argument, right? Now we're pointing at argument, what you know, what is what is better. Um, so, you know, again, thinking about your, not to no, pick on you, Lindsay, but in order to win Monopoly, one needs to be a good trash talker. Um, this at least points to an argument, no? Uh, in order to be a good sleeper, one needs to have this gel mattress thing. This points to an argument, right? Um, in an online environment, I would ask students to create a kind of Canva or some type of poster, right? And here's one that I created this past year to kind of present myself to the rest of the class. This is me teaching Spanish. This is what we know about Spanish. Uh, kind of uh, go to Canva and create your own kind of uh, poster to kind of self-promote. If we think about, again, Goffman's idea of the presentation of the self, in what sense are you an expert? What do you know that others don't? What is the secret to your success? This idea can be translated quite well into what the categories are given from the University of Chicago. And if I'm not being clear here, please do stop me. Effectively, what the University of Chicago gives us is a type of toolkit, uh, the, Little Red, the Little Red Schoolhouse writing program that was also used at the University of uh, Virginia for many years, I think is not anymore. Uh, it gives us these terms to play around with as we craft an argument. So again, thinking about you as an expert, being part of this online environment, maybe having students create some type of Canva posters, um, putting them into breakout rooms, asking them to, to really test themselves in terms of arguments. These are kind of the, 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 we'll say, categories of analysis that I give to students as I have them walk through their argumentative essays and their idea that they are an expert. So again, the theme, uh, perhaps your theme is board games. Perhaps your theme is taking naps. Perhaps your theme is eating. What is the interpretive question? What is the interpretive question? Um, you know, um, what do some people don't know about Monopoly? Maybe people don't know the fact that should you should you be a vocal player of Monopoly? Should you not be a vocal player in Monopoly? What do we agree upon? We agree upon that Monopoly is very much about social interaction, maybe. Maybe that's a truth that we agree upon and that um, conversation will probably will ensue during Monopoly. So why not be a good trash talker? What we don't agree upon, maybe we don't agree upon whether trash talking is the right way to go in Monopoly. Maybe you'd be better... Um, cajoling people, being very nice to people, trying to bargain with people in a schmoozing type of way. Um, what's the cost of benefit? That's obvious. If we don't figure this out, we won't win Monopoly. If we don't win Monopoly, well, we won't be an actualized person. Okay. Um, our claim, trash talk during Monopoly then. Again, we kind of go back to our arguments, our claim. When the University of Chicago talks about claim, they talk about argument, right? Um, what is the claim of the essay? And again, this type of claim will appear in different places depending on one's field of study. Some people in the humanities like the beginning, some people the sciences like it at the end. But the important thing, I think, and certainly I think this is true at least certainly maybe not in junior high, but certainly then in a high school. And certainly by the time one gets to college, if you don't have a claim or a thesis, you don't have an argument. If you don't have a problem, you don't have an argument and you don't have a paper. The other categories get pretty slippery pretty quickly. And these are very, you need to finesse these and we'll see about how we kind of do this very quickly. Um, Jeans. A few years ago, skinny jeans were in. This is probably not true anymore. I'm not certain. I'm an old uh, man, certainly compared to my students. But skinny jeans were very popular a few years back. And so here we have the claim. 
Um, again, I'm taking very much mundane things of the everyday, normal everyday things. Can students create an argument about them? How does that relate to what they are as a person? What does it mean to consider themselves as an expert? The claim. These are, these are mine that I created. You can agree or disagree. You can think they're good or bad. Any kind of comments are welcome. The claim, the thesis, skinny jeans have become more popular as local governments have advocated cycling culture, right? A recent town wants, wants other uh, new, new bicycle paths. Um, we have ads against uh, you know, opening your doors and knocking over bicyclists. That's the claim. Does, do they actually have anything in common? Maybe, maybe not. I'm not certain. Uh, what is the evidence? In cities where bicycle lanes have been built, Levi's have reported the sale of skinny jeans have increased. The warrants, the warrants, according to the University of Chicago, is what buttresses your evidence. And finally, the rebuttal, right? How you would take on, how would you would disagree with that, which you may want to include in your uh, thesis, in your uh, paper. Um, other ideas, again, dating myself a bit, Glee, if anyone remembers the program Glee, great, great program. Um, my claim is that it was the best television program ever. What is my evidence? There's never been another TV program that has included a greater variety of genres, drama, musical numbers, comedy. It had everything. It had a bit of drama, um, romance, uh, comedy. There was a bit of everything on that and so what buttresses that evidence? Evidence is not ultimately uh, enough. You also need the warrant, right? Why you, why you produce that evidence. The warrant would be variety is the spice of life. Variety is the spice of life. Um, you could agree with that and you could say that variety is the spice of life. However, I think that American Idol offers um, amazing amount of drama, more musical, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this is kind of where I want to kind of get towards kind of what I'm getting at. I think this is the one I like the best, perhaps because I'm from Chicago, uh, but I dislike Chicago style pizza. Um, as people may know, uh, there are two types of pizzas, uh, generally speaking, in the United States, New York style and Chicago style. Those are kind of like the two main ones that people imagine. Of course, people talk about Detroit style pizza. My favorite is, of course, New Haven style pizza. If anyone's been to New Haven, also delicious. Um, let's take a bit of a survey. What do people think? We have New York style pizza, with, which is flint, excuse me, thin, um, kind of really cheesy. Uh, the, the, the point is to kind of mix the cheese and the sauce together. And then we have Chicago style, which is thick, almost lasagna-like. We have certainly national chains in the U.S. like Uno, um, Lou Malnati's has a bit of a scene. Usually you have this, uh, sometimes it's stuffed, but you always have the kind of sauce on top, pretty much. Uh, the cheese under the sauce, strangely enough, who does that? And certainly it's very thick. Um, interesting, <laughs> Lindsay Byers says I've never had chicken. <laughs> I don't recommend it, but... Um, Maybe you'll like it. Um, any ideas? Any types of favorite pizzas that people like? Any types of favorite pizza? Thin or thick thick crust, I guess, would be maybe kind of a general way of... thick crust. What is that now? I love thick crust. Who got to the, who, said, who said that now? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, for yeah. Um, interesting. Well, what is it about thick crust that you like? Can you tell me about that? Could you argue that? That's the best part. I always save the crust for last. Something it, about the doughiness of it. The crust. Yeah, the crust. That's that's fair. That's I'm from Long Island, New York. Jenna Rose. Fabulous. That's that's the thing. OK, the thin crust. Understood. I like thin crust. I'm from Long Island, New York. That's that's fair. Um, it's got to be the carbohydrates that one is ingesting with Chicago style has got to be. Naples is the best in the world. I'm from Costa Rica, but studying Italy because of the pizza <laughs> that they do want. New York, definitely. No one likes Chicago pizza, not even me. I'm from Chicago. How would we argue that, though? Is there kind of a kind of way that we could argue that? And here's what I came up with. 
um, in a general sense. We could start clicking through these and kind of have students produce this, right? We could have students produce this as we go along. So again, the theme, let's see if I can put it up here. The theme is pizza. What would be our interpretive question? What would be our interpretive question? Again, not exactly, it, it can be about it, it likes and dislikes, but what would the interpretive question be? And I certainly have an answer and certainly we can agree to disagree too. Is thin crust or thick crust better? Yeah, yeah, something like this. Yeah, it's it's not. Again, we're not dealing with rocket science. Uh, yeah, that's something that I said. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, is New York style or Chicago style pizza better? Um, and again, you could use this. This would be a great start to, place to start with. Uh, you being an expert. No, if you're an expert at naps, um, how do you get to an interpretive question with the idea of naps and what you know that we don't know? Um, what do you know about Mauricio? What do you know about eating that, that, that no one else knows? And what's the interpretive question that goes along with it? Uh, what we agree upon, sometimes that's kind of, um, we could think about that in terms of type of, of a scarecrow, right? In say a straw man. We just kind of put that up there in the piece to kind of knock it down. Uh, both are delicious. We know that, that pizza is delicious in their own way. What we don't agree upon, which is better, and we could even kind of make some caveats about that, uh, which is better for students with little money, with little time, et cetera, et cetera. What are the cost benefits if we don't figure this out? What are the costs and benefits if we don't figure that out? And that's kind of one of the most important categories of the Little Red Schoolhouse um, toolkit. What happens, what are the consequences? What are the consequences if we don't figure this out? And again, we can be a bit silly with this. Again, this is training students to be experts, to kind of be able to present themselves and to, of course, write better um, and to be better thinkers in terms of arguments. And we can be a bit silly. If we don't figure this out, people will eat horrible pizza forever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, we will not be as satisfied as what I put. Yeah, absolutely. We'll have less than perfect diets, less money, et cetera, et cetera. And so think about this in your paper. No, um, if we don't figure out how to how to win Monopoly, we won't win. If we don't figure out how to be trash truckers, we won't win Monopoly. If we don't know, we can't figure out how to how to nap, how to nap correctly. Uh, we certainly will, we will be ragged, run down, et cetera, et cetera. They will Our, go to New Jersey and they'll think it's New York style pizza. Say what now? I'm sorry, go ahead. I said they will go to New Jersey and they'll think it's New York style pizza. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Uh, our claim, New York style is better. I, I, at least that's how I think about these things. Certainly I love uh, New York style pizza. I dislike Chicago style. Whenever my friends and I meet uh, in my hometown in Chicago, inevitably someone says, let's do Chicago style pizza. Um, it happens, but it's not something I enjoy. The reasons, now this is the interesting part, the reasons, it's easier to fold, it's easier to eat, you can pet off the grease, you can easier to carry, it's better for a snack and less time consuming. And this is where it gets hairy, these kind of final categories. I would urge you to tell your students to give them these 10 or 11 categories of analysis and have them produce this, have them produce this, give it back to you, and then have them come to the online session um, or the, 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 the in-person session. And now that we're living this kind of intermediary time, um, are, are we back in session? Are we still online? Um, in order to present the self again and think about this. Um, the evidence to support those reasons, you can you can fold thin things, thin things. Um, you can't pat the grease off of Chicago sauce. And finally, just personal experience. What is the justification for the evidence? We've all tried to carry food. Right. Possible problems. Um, maybe you could say, well, students need Chicago style pizza to fill them up. Maybe it's cost effective. And uh, it's a possible rebuttal. It may be more filling, but you need to watch your diet too. So maybe um, 
maybe a type of rebuttal thinking about your great example uh lindsay maybe it's good to trash talk during monopoly but at the same time maybe at the same time you could really make people kind of angry about that um and people would really walk away from the game being being hurt and so these are about it's about forging an interesting argument and making people work for that argument um in order to be able to present their self um and again uh for me uh i'd love to think about how to kind of branch this out into one's kind of online persona, uh, whether that be a Canva poster, whether that be um, a, a type of, of PowerPoint presentation, how that would work in the online environment if you could have students make avatars in a certain way and to have that avatar be an expert on these themes. But the idea is again, kind of lo-fi, excuse me, um, how to make cogent arguments, how to make uh, compelling, uh, how to write compelling academic prose, but also um, presenting themselves in the online environment. Um, that's pretty much what I have today. I, I thought I was presenting for only 15 minutes, to be quite honest. I misread the schedule. But certainly, if we want to have a conversation about anything we've, I've, I've seen today, if certainly are there any ideas about how I can branch this out um, in order to refine this idea, I, I, they would be very much welcome. Maybe at like the beginning of um, asking questions, you have students do like a, a survey of if they even have tried different styles of pizza. So for instance, like if you're talking to like yeah. Fourth graders, they might have not had Chicago style pizza. They've only might have just had the pizza down the road. So get something that we can argue about. That's what I'm understanding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If we, we if we can't argue, if we if we don't know what we're arguing about, that's even if in this this again, this very mundane way. Uh the idea is of course to at least work these um what would you call them? These kind of uh the, 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 these kind of muscles, if you would, uh, work this type of rhetorical jet gesture um, in order to make them step into a, a more substantive argument in their classes, whether that class be about language, whether that class be about um, history, whether that be about their admissions essay in order to get into college, that might be important too. I was thinking about that the other day with one of my um, one of the, the, the students I, I tutor in high school. Um, there's so many realms of life that, that, that are missing this kind of rhetorical gesture that points to a cogent argument. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Maybe a survey ahead of time to think about what are we gonna talk about? What's, um, absolutely. What are the television programs? What kind of arguments could be made about those programs? What are the books that ha one has read? Um, absolutely. No, a bit of, a bit of, um, brainstorming, I guess, before you kind of get to what you'll argue about. You could also provide like maybe a video. Like uh, I know that some um, people do like virtual tours of like food eating around um, different types of cities. Hmm. So you can maybe show them that. Yeah. Get them started. Interesting. Yeah. 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 Think about, again, food is, is an easy entrance into uh, these type of, of argument construction and problem construction and crafting a, a thesis, crafting an argument. Right? Well, I thought this was great. I liked um, everyone's expert expertises. Uh, <laughs> I enjoyed mm -hmm. that. Um, and I like the how the questions are listed because sometimes when I'm writing essays, I can't hmm. get lost in my own essay and then I have to cut things out. So having these steps can make it easier and produce better work. What, what is your field, Lindsay? So I'm a math major, but I'm getting certified in childhood and um, special education. Understood. Very cool. I would say, I would say yeah. Um, certainly, again, I, I, I can't... My specialization is, I guess, the university level, whatever that means. I will say that, you know, when students come to me, whether that be about learning a second language, that is a Spanish, the language I usually teach, whether that be about 
uh, their essays, whether that be for a side project or a student um, uh, an independent study of some sort. Um, you know, one of the things that I notice is, you know, how do we get away from the five paragraph essays? Um, you know, how do we get to argument? How do we get to something substantive? Even if it's in a small way, even if it's, if it's about Chicago versus New York style pizza, you know, again, this is, um, we need to train these muscles as much as we can. And, and sometimes you'll get different answers. Sometimes you'll get different answers. Sometimes an argument just kind of falls apart. Um, but absolutely, I would urge you as, as, a, as an educator for, 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 for secondary level, for, for high school, please do. Uh, even in math, maybe, what's, what's the argument? How do you get to QED? What's the proof look like? Um, absolutely, we're, I, I would feel that uh, at this moment, when we're moving towards all these technological devices, when we are so in, uh, digitized and whatnot, um, we also need to remember that, 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 that we have to give students a good sense of, of finding themselves and, and, and crafting cogent arguments. I actually really enjoyed that you didn't have as many slides as you planned because you weren't sure how the, long the session would be. I liked the, how we had that discussion. I liked I liked interacting. I missed it with the pandemic. <laughs> I think that's that's my sense about I don't know how people feel about this. And obviously, this is kind of getting more into a, a kind of colloquial conversation now. But I, I think I have seen both things. I have seen some of my more timid students really take the online uh, interface. Um, far less, far fewer students um, in, enjoy the online environment. Um, but I would say in a general term, Absolutely, you know, and this is part of kind of this this lesson or this this kind of theme of ideas. How do we get to, to present oneself? How do we get to, to interact? How do we get to say that you two are an expert? Um, how do we get to you know someone who something that feels more human um, when um, it, it's 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 so hard at the present time? So. I've even noticed in my in-person classes where I teach their in-person classes. At the same time, students' ability to kind of dissociate behind the mask, um, which is not to say I, I I certainly do believe in I do believe in science, obviously, but at the same time, it's there there are consequences, right? And and a student's ability to disassociate behind the mask is 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 pretty intense. And that's been very hard, certainly in a language class, in the humanities and the communications courses. So absolutely. So any other, I guess, final final comments. No, if thank you. No one else has anyone to add. If no one else has anything to add, I no. would love to take this time for um, just acknowledging you. And I want to behalf on on behalf of everyone. Um, thank you for your interesting and enlightening presentation. And we all wish you continued success. No, thank you. Thank you. Please, please do write me. My. Um, Email is is there. Please do reach out. I'm on uh, what LinkedIn. I'm on Academia. Um, certainly, again, uh, I didn't think my presentation would be this long, but uh, hopefully, there's other interesting presentations to get to. And and certainly, I love to share my thoughts and talk with other educators. So thank you so much. Absolutely, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. My name is Mauricio Navarro. Uh, actually, I'm from Costa Rica. Um, but also representing Italy, of course, because I, I am part of the Italian uh, Capital Tapai chapter and also a PhD student in Italy. So today I'm co-hosting this workshop uh, together with Professor Santiago Lopez, who is also here and who is also from Costa Rica. So let's take a look. Uh, okay, uh, what we are doing here is to share something that we think it's really um, useful as uh, everything that has been shared in this conference so far. So uh, we believe that this is an educational experience uh, that really needs to be shared. Uh, but also we want to create a space uh, for sharing other educational experience. Um, so for achieve this, we, we were thinking about a three moments workshop. So in the first moment, uh, Santiago is going to share with us his experience as a teacher. Um, during the pandemic times, he's a teacher in Costa Rica, an English teacher. Uh, but especially this innovative uh, strategy that brings social emotional accompaniment uh, to students by recreation, recreation activities. So that, that's really amazing, uh, that, that thing that they're doing at 
um, at the Colegio del Rosario at San Jose. This is the capital of Costa Rica. So this is going to be the first uh, moment of this workshop. After that, in the second moment, um, also Santiago will continue by sharing instead uh, a little bit of, about his experience as not only as an educator, but also as a person, you know, uh, like all of us dealing with all the stress that online pandemic education time brought. And the idea is to invite um, all of you, all of us to, to share experience. So the third moment, we'll be, um, we'll be glad to hear about you. Um, the hopefully we we'll have enough time uh, to the participants to share uh, in, in the chat or, or by, by, by the camera and, and the microphone as, as you uh, prefer uh, to share successful or not successful experience. So we can dialogue a little bit about all of this. So for beginning, let's hear this amazing experience from Santiago and their, um, their campaigns at, at Colegio Rosario at San Jose, Costa Rica. So Santi, thanks uh, for being here and go on. Let's begin. Okay, thank you, Mauricio. Uh, well, it's a pleasure uh, to be here sharing um, my experience, um, in my educational experience during these pandemic times that, well, it's been difficult and I'm sure that um, it's been difficult for all of us. Um, however, the, the fact that, that we are here uh, sharing and, and listening um, from others and learning from each other, um, it makes me uh, think that um, there's something positive, you know? Um, pandemic times brought a lot of isolation on people. However, also brought the idea that uh, we really need to get closer. So, um, and if we, get, if we get closer um, through um, education, um, I'm sure that um, we are going to be able to build, to build a wonderful thing. So uh, these kind of uh, spaces uh, are uh, extremely positive uh, for us um, as professionals, in education, but also for our students, because we are going to uh, be acquiring and uh, and sharing um, important information and applying um, important techniques and strategies um, into our institutions. So, um, well, um, good evening, good afternoon. Um, it depends on the part of the world you are. Uh, I'm going to start um, by explaining about a project that I coordinate and that was part of my dis dissertation um, project for my master's degree. And that's, well, I had the chance to apply it into my institution. And uh, that has been, um, well, that has brought a um, pretty positive effect on our students. Um, I'm just going to start um, contextualizing a little bit uh, the situation and then how uh, we started implementing this into um, our institution. Well, first of all, um, let's start like going a little bit uh, back um, in the days in which we didn't have the pandemic situation. Everything was just normal, uh, normal classes, uh, normal um, schedules, but then uh, from one day to another, a uh, pandemic um, just came and um, everything changed. Um, for example, in Costa Rica, um, I remember that it was a Friday, I finished my regular classes, I should say goodbye to my students, and um, next Monday, we were already into a lockdown. So um, it was a pretty difficult and shocking uh, weekend and uh, which basically drastically changed everything. So um, at the beginning, people and students started like just um, acting in their houses with the normality that we have previous pandemic. And um, over, um, over time, uh, as time uh, passed, um, we were able to notice that there were certain, uh, certain needs that needed to be 
uh, satisfied, especially uh, emotional needs. How did we notice that? Well, we started listening to our students. We started taking the time to do more, to do, to give more individual, um, um, individual approaches to uh, to them, and we started realizing that uh, some students basically thought of high school as their homes, and due to the pandemic, um, they were isolated, they were in a lockdown, and they were pretty lonely. Um, so we just thought we need to do something about this. Um, time uh, kept going, and um, we realized that students didn't know how to, um, how to manage and how to take advantage uh, of their free time, their free time. So, uh, that was like basically causing um, a negative effect in their well-being. And they were acting as if nothing was happening into um, a new reality, which was uh, the reality of uh, COVID-19. Um, students uh, were uh, connected in virtual classes. And after that, they had to do in the academical duties. So they felt that they were uh, overcharged with this. Uh, they felt overwhelmed. Uh, they were basically uh, in front of, of the computer uh, 10 to 12 hours per day. And uh, that was exaggerated. And that was um, extremely negative uh, for them. Um, not only for their emotional um, for their emotional situation, but also for their physical structure, their physical composition. It was it was like um, their composure during eight to ten uh, hours per day was just like leaning towards a computer, which caused them to feel um, exhausted and with pain. Um, and they didn't even find um, they didn't even find a, an evident explanation why they were feeling like this. So we started just like um, noticing that on them and, and making them uh, aware of what was happening. So uh, what we decided uh, to do was to teach them how to take advantage of their free time. Um, this is something that sounds um, pretty simple in words. However, it has like a um, pretty interesting depth. Depth. I'm sorry. Um, on uh, on the process. Um, let's just think about recess. You know, recess, like the the the, the break that uh, people have. Uh, between classes in, in educational institutions. And when we think about it, sometimes it's like, like normality, especially here in Costa Rica, it's like uh, there was um, an edu educational divorce between those periods of times and the, um, and, and, the, and the educational practice. It, it was like when they go to recess, they basically, were inside the institution, but doing nothing, actually. Some of them were just sitting. Some of them were uh, just like waiting for the time to happen to go back to class. Um, during pandemic, it was the same. In between virtual classes, when they have a, uh, their free time, what they did was they just went to bed and just lay down. So that was it. They were uh, basically uh, uh, doing doing nothing for uh, during these periods. So we identified that. We identified that they, they basically were not receiving the sunlight during the whole days. They were just into the rooms, into the house, into the houses, and they were not doing any active. Um, 
any active practices. Um, so we basically developed um, a program in which we taught them how to take advantage of this. And the results, uh, the results were um, pretty interesting because um, at the very beginning, um, how they perceived um, about this, uh, this model was that we were forcing them to do things. And, and actually they were a little bit, you know, like a, a defensive, but as days continued, as they passed, actually we started receiving an interesting feedback from them because they were planning. They were already planning in the, the management of their free time. So, um, we noticed that um, they were not only planning and planning them bl planning it. I'm sorry, um, in their individual in their in their individuality, families families were planning the management of their of their free time in the houses during the lockdown. So we started developing meetings. Sorry, we started developing a um, virtual 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 meetings in which families were sharing uh, what they were doing together and actually um, we noticed that um, it was contagious because uh, as they shared they started implementing what other families were doing they started cooking together they started playing uh, board games together and they started having uh, walks together they started uh, drawing together, they started uh, singing together, and actually um, parents and students told me that they were doing things that before the pandemic never came to their mind. So um, when we started noticing that uh, the emotional state of our student was kind of uh, low, so we started implementing this, with the students, but then uh, we began to notice that um, it just um, started like increasing the participation among them and also among their families, which brought um, an unification as an institution, but from uh, the nucleus of their houses. So that was a way in which we tackled um, the um, emotional accompaniment to our um, to our students, and it was pretty positive. It was a uh, pretty helpful, and it gave us to understand a lot more about what was going on in houses. And we cannot uh, leave aside the situation of our students in their houses and just focus on what happens inside the institution. And uh, one of the advantages of the pandemic was that um, through this, we got to know um, what, uh, how our students were behaving, how our students uh, were acting and how they were relating and uh, interacting with, um, uh, with their families. Um, and this was because of teaching them how to take an advantage and how to manage their free time. Then we notice also that um, this brought a sense of uh, organization in our students' uh, daily routines. Uh, it brought also um, um, an improvement in their physical condition. It brought also uh, how their creativity fostered because they started practicing things that uh, they were not used to. And um, we noticed also how some families, they just got even closer uh, because they were doing, they were doing activities, uh, parents, daughters, sons. And so, so it was uh, pretty positive. Um, also, 
when restrictions started started to um, just losing out a little bit, uh, we were able to go back to the institution and we started the um, bimodal education, which means that um, we were receiving like half groups uh, one, uh, one week and the next week we will receive the other half. So while half of the group uh, were in presential classes, the other half um, they were connect they were they were connected in, in virtual classes. So we installed cameras in each of the houses, and uh, we started developing uh, our classes like this. Uh, due to restrictions, um, because of the educational and health uh, ministry in Costa Rica, um, we had to reorganize everything in our institution. And, and recess was a key element there. We were not able to let students just to go and walk in and, 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 and basically interact with people from other, from other groups. So we reorganized um, how recess, how recesses um, were going to be developed in our institution. So um, I was the coordinator of this of this project. Well, I am because we're still in in the school year, and um, we just started like uh, with with a with a, with a, um, a group of teachers. Uh, we started in uh, uh, developing. We developed a, a program in which uh, we just wanted to apply what we were apply, applying in the virtual classes, but now in bimodal. In, in bimodal education. So um, we basically organize our, our institution, uh, our facilities in uh, 12 areas. And on each area we had, or we have, we still have um, a different activity to do. However, the key element was that uh, the students were the ones who um, are in charge of planning what they wanted to do. So to start, we gave them a model as an example, and then uh, we let them know that uh, this model um, was free to uh, receive any adjustment uh, as they wanted. So uh, as the weeks started passing, uh, the groups were actually planning their recesses and they were creating their own activities. They were um, um, requesting for different materials because they were just bringing up um, ideas in order to implement in their free time. Now, um, the impact that uh, this program and that this model uh, has in the institution goes beyond the recess time. It is not only the activities that they were doing, is that they were taking their time as groups to plan them. They are still doing it. Is that uh, they were doing a um, activities and uh, they were immersed in in practices in practices that they were not used to before is that that they were exploring themselves by the interaction with their peers and something very important and um, which is like the core of what i state in my dis dissertation uh, paper this is a way in which conflicts can be tackled. Conflicts in educational institution mostly occur during the recess time because it's the time in which the focus of attention of the individual is basically not direct directed. So by addressing their focus of attention during this period of time, there were just 
well, they have been doing the whole year, having fun. And they have been immersed in positive interaction with their, with their peers. They have been fostering their creativity and they have been doing physical um, exercise. We noticed that the, uh, there were some students who usually don't like to practice any sports or any physical activity, and they were just getting into it because the group just basically, um, and the whole group or their peers just basically absorb them into uh, the activities that they were planning. And they were just laughing. They were uh, just running. They were jumping. They were playing. And they were having a pretty good time. And I have been able uh, to, to talk to uh, the psychologists and orientators from uh, the institution and even guide teachers also because I'm pretty interested to um, collect data about this. And the, the answers that I have received uh, in terms of conflicts uh, after we started applying this model in, in our institution is that uh, they told me, well, our daily duties before this were to solve conflicts during risk. And when we started applying this into our institution, the conflict rate just significantly diminished in, in, this, in this area. And well, it's something that it's, I mean, I have to mention it, it is not like conflicts are going to be eliminated because they are an inherent part of an interaction. However, they have been in, Substantial, so substantially diminished in number and also in types of conflicts. So uh, that has been a, a pretty positive aspect that uh, we have experienced during this um, during this like a pa pandemic times in, in our institution and by. Um, the, um, the positive interaction and the positive activities that they have been doing, uh, we tackled also the emotional um, state and, and how negative they were, uh, uh, the negativity that they were experiencing uh, through uh, because of the pandemic in their daily lives. Um, so let, let me just take a look if I have any. Okay. So I think that's um, um, this is yeah yes yes Santiago thank you so much uh, we we want to share with all of of you this this idea because you know social emotional accompaniment needs of students students needs um, uh, response by recreation activities by recess time by free time sometimes something uh, we don't think a lot. Um, uh, and this, I think this is a, a great project that is already um, run. And there's also a, a research, a paper research uh, that was conducted by, by Santiago. So if you're interested, you can contact him. Um, and, but, but the second part is also important for us. We, when we were planning this workshop, we were um, thinking, well, that, that's really important, the students' needs. I believe almost uh, all of this conference, these three days is about uh, students need, but what about us? What about us as educators? Our needs, because we are also human beings. We are also in, in a lot of stress, especially during pandemic times. Well, actually in Costa Rica, well, uh, we are in pandemic times <laughs> because uh, as Santiago said, it's a bimodal education and everything is different, etc. cetera. Uh, not, not everybody is, is getting a machine, for example. So it's, it's a Latin American reality. We are still here in pandemic times. So what about us? What about educator uh, health, men mental health, um, social, emotional needs? So Santiago, can you share a little bit about uh, your experience? Because you already shared your experience with the students, your experience with yourself. What did you uh, do uh, to manage all this uh, 
social emotional stress um, stuff and issues. This is the second part. Uh, I just remember there are going to be a third time, a third part after that to share, to dialogue uh, all of us. But this is uh, the beginning of the second part. So Santiago, we won. Okay. Well, yes. Well, thank you, uh, Mauricio. Um, now I'm going to talk about my, my personal experience, uh, how I uh, identified certain, um, certain situations that were affecting me and uh, certain things that I started uh, doing, like in order to tackle this. And I remember that the first thing that, um, then that now I see it as, um, as a drawback and actually, which was something that I learned, but at the beginning I applied it and actually it was like not positive, is that um, from one day to another one, our reality changed and myself, I just continued with the same chip. And now I just, uh, I just think, of course, I was using the normality chip into the um, pandemic reality and there is no compatibility. I was acting the same in a different reality. So um, then I just found myself like extremely um, uh, overwhelmed because I was basically overcharged um, with, with my job, with my task. I was also, uh, well, besides giving classes, I was also assisting uh, my students and their parents. And uh, which led me to basically um, slept four to five hours per day. And that was drastically affecting me uh, in a way in which I thought that I was sleeping. However, I was not resting. And uh, I'm sure that uh, some of you or, or all of you um, experienced a similar similar situations. So I just started no, noticing that my circadian uh, rhythm uh, was totally like basically it went crazy, um, um, and I just what I did. I just one day I sat in my in my desk and I just established. Um, an order of priorities. And then I did the first draft. And I remember that uh, I put like, well, I uh, have to suffice the academical needs of my students. Um, I need to um, um, really um, like help and get meetings and um, try to tackle certain situations and certain problems that uh, the, the families or of my students are um, experiencing. And then I could, well, I have to sleep more. Uh, I have to get more free time for myself. And then I just started watching that draft. And I see, well, my gosh, this is my set of priorities, but the real priorities, I mean, the pro priorities in which I am directly immersed are at the bottom. So, I just basically erased, erased everything that I've written and I reorganized it. So I put myself on top. Then I realized, okay, yes, I really care about my students. I really care about their families. But if I don't take care of myself, I am not going to be able to help them in this situation. So I basically learned to put myself first in order to be able uh, to perform in, in a better way with my students and their families. But uh, I have to tell you, this wasn't something that I just um, started doing from one day to another one. It was a whole inner process that, um, that I experienced through these times. Um, and it led me 
it led me uh, to reach other aspects of my life. For example, um, I noticed that um, social media was affecting me. I noticed that social media um, was really affecting me. So I erased Facebook from my phone. And actually I just, I froze my, my Facebook account. I, and it happened one day that I just got into Facebook. I got out of Facebook and instantly I got into Facebook again. You know, like this, all this, like in 15 seconds. And then I, what I was, the input that I was receiving from what I was uh, watching there, uh, it was just negativity. So I erased it. And then say, then say oh my gosh, I, I'm feeling like basically like if it was like if I was in a detox from social media. Then I did the same, but with WhatsApp groups. I started noticing that there were some groups, WhatsApp groups that they were not like um, cooperating in a positive way to my well-being. So I just started getting out of a WhatsApp groups too. And then I noticed that I was feeling like if I just took out a gigantic weight from my back and I was able to function better. Then I say, oh my gosh, I'm thinking about myself and this feels good. So I started applying this into a how I manage a stress. I mean, um, it was not that I was not worrying about situations. It was that I really selected what to worry about and I learned how to identify and how to differentiate what really, really needed my, my full attention and what was not important. So I started by going this and applying this day by day, day by day, day by day, in with, until um, I was feeling that I was like functioning again and into a, a new reality. Um, but if I have to summarize this, I started feeling better until I was aware that I was putting myself first and then the rest. And, and it was a pretty difficult decision because of social dominance, because of, um, of course, my, my responsibilities. However, um, I just realized that I will suffice my responsibilities in a better way until I learn how to put myself first and I will be um, able to, to perform at my maximum skills. So when I learned that, I started uh, performing and I know that my students in, my fa in the families of my students started receiving a better attention from me. So um, this was just a brief part of my, my personal experience in during pandemic times. Yeah, that's, that's really great, excellent. Thank you, Santiago, for sharing that. Uh, our idea was not only to share these, um, this project and this research um, uh, challenge and, and also results, but 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 do it it as as a personal thing, you know, because we are person, we are human beings, and we are all in this COVID nineteen era. So uh, uh, this idea of the of the workshop is is really uh, to to share a personal um, experience, but also to motivate uh, to 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 every one of us to to share some personal experience. Uh, uh, let's say by accompaniment as uh, social emotional uh, issues of our students, but also accompany ourselves. You know, we don't want to to say that this is the the, the response or the the unique response because for someone, uh, for instance, maybe Facebook is the the way to escape the reality. We don't know, but this this works for for Santiago. But the important thing is to think about ourselves first, and then think about our students. 
and, and think about them, not, not only uh, in the academic stuff, but also in the emotional, social emotional stuff. So thank you, Santiago, for sharing this, um, the, all this, your project, but also your uh, personal experience. Uh, we hope we have enough time. Uh, we hope uh, we have motivated you to share a little bit about uh, yourself as educators. So we, we are uh, looking forward to hear about you. Uh, you can write anything in the chat, anything that you think, uh, maybe uh, some personal experience, maybe some project that you are um, carrying on. Uh, but you can also take the war, you know, like uh, put on your camera and just yes, speak a little bit about your experience as teachers, as educators, uh, and as persons, just as Santiago did. So um, the space is open, the war is yours. Um, anyone wants to say anything in the chat or by, by the camera? Okay, there's uh, Dr. Maura Strano from Italy. That is my professor tutor, thanks to be here. And she's sharing with us. I have been also very frustrated from the fact that the students did not turn on the video cam ah, did not turn on the video, cam the video camera during classes. Yeah, th that's a really um, big issue because sometimes uh, actually you cannot turn on the camera, but not all times, you know? Uh, yeah, it, it, it's, well, th this is what I think. There are some times that because of something special uh, that is going on in your house, uh, maybe uh, family stuff, you cannot turn on your camera. But if you never turn on your camera, then uh, we, we, we just think we are like speaking to the wall, you know? <laughs> That's really a, a strange thing, um, a strange feeling that, that I think everyone is sharing. So how to motivate the students to turn on cameras um, yeah, that, that's a really a big issue. Thanks for, for sharing that. I don't know if a, anyone else want to make a comment about this or anything else. Yeah, Lindsay, go on. As a student, it's so funny. I don't know why I don't turn on my camera. <laughs> so sometimes um, I go in and I'm like, oh, no one else has their camera on. I don't know, you know? And other times I'm like, oh, I'll turn my camera on. And I, I have no reason. And um, what's funny is like, if, if I'm presenting an event, I'm like, oh, can everyone turn their cameras on? But if I'm in class, I'm like, eh, I'll just leave it off. It's so, I don't know why it's strange. Yeah, it's uh, the new reality. As Stacy says, I tell my students, it's very important that they keep their cameras on. I know additional backgrounds should be on. Okay, Stacy. Okay, that's that's something that works for you. And actually, okay. those backgrounds sometimes are like they are so creative. You know, like yeah. what they use is like, <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> but yes, and actually, well, it's something that at the very beginning I was pretty frustrated by this too. You know, like I felt like I was like just talking to nothing, but then. I learned to talk to nothing, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's like, it, it's, you know, it's part of what I was, um, what I was mentioning before. I was like very letting this affect in me, you know, like a lot. And then say, well, I cannot let this affect me. I'm going to do my job. I'm going to, to do my best. And something that I noticed was that, okay, if you don't want to turn on the camera, okay, I'm not going to force you. But then during the class, I should have started like just asking and asking and, and soliciting uh, for participation. And they were answering, you know, like, and they were participating. So yeah. I said, well, they don't want me to see them or they don't want them. They don't want people to see them, but they are paying attention. So that's yeah. a win for me, you know, like they are into it. But yes, I was pretty frustrated, fr frustrated too at the beginning but there was like uh, there, there are some options also to negotiate uh, uh, with them uh, in order to like to activate their camera sometimes i remember i did like some bingo activities and certain things so they um they activated them but uh, the first thing i was i'm not going to let this affect me more i'm not going to get sad by this and i'm i'm have to practice how to talk to nothing so, and sometimes, and most of the time, nothing was participating into the class. Okay. So 
I was happy with nothing. <laughs> I believe it's also important um, to us as teachers, you know, to share with students what we are feeling, because um, sometimes I just say, you know, I'm I'm not pretty sure if I'm talking to nothing. Um, am I alone here? I'm talking to the wall, and there's a voice, maybe not a camera, but a voice is saying, "Hey, here we are," <laughs> and okay, there there they are. At least one of them, two of them, and yeah, we need to 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 think about this as the new reality. But I think that the interesting thing is to share with our students that we are uh, also persons, but also human beings with emotional feelings and, and thoughts and, and problems and family issues that we are, yes, thinking as, as they are. Um, we are not machines. So um, that, that's important. That's important to share. And that's the idea of this workshop. Um, uh, so thanks. Let's see the chat. Uh, Julia just said it's fine line. Uh, it's a fine line because, as mentioned in a previous talk, there could be other things going on that they may permit the use of the camera. Yeah, that's true. But other times, with no feedback, I know how hard it is. I think we have been all. Yeah, we all have been there. Probably. Yeah, that's really true. I think okay. also I will turn on my camera if I'm comfortable with the teacher. Okay. So, yeah. Okay, that, that, that's, that's a, a reality for you. I believe some students may think like that. I believe not all students, maybe some of them, I don't know, there could be a lot of reasons. Kind of going okay. off what Lynn said, sometimes when I'm in a class and say I'm the only one with my camera on, then at least in my experience, the professor is more likely to turn to me be like hey what do you think whereas I'm just another student in this entire class why don't you ask somebody else but because my camera is on you mm -hmm. know it's more of like I'm gonna pick you so I think that's a reason why <laughs> you know it kind of trickles like if two people have their camera on and some people start to turn it on it's only yeah. one person forget about it but it's like being in the first row <laughs> yeah exactly. yeah Actually, that's what I'm thinking. That that yeah, what Julia said also uh, happened in, in you know in presence. You know, you you as a teacher, you see one student that is really interested in your class, and you just ask him or her, <laughs> and and him uh, he or she can just think this. Why me? There's a lot of all students here, so it's really interesting. It's really interesting thing to to think about it. But the thing is, is that's only good for one student's experience. The teacher's job is for every student to be on task with the content and knowing what's going about in class. And I don't think the teacher can fully know that if they're on Zoom. If they're in an in-person class, then they could visually see who's paying attention and who's not. Because yeah. in Zoom, they could just take a screenshot that the student's like looking like they're paying attention. But in reality, they're just watching TV downstairs. We really don't know which is why like, I think Zoom is affecting us, teachers and students, significantly. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you, Dominic. That's, that's uh, really true. Um, actually, they can uh, have the, their camera on and they can uh, be, uh, yes, making another thing on their computers. And you just see uh, their faces, but they're just, I don't know, looking at Facebook or watching another, um, I don't know, Netflix. Yeah, they can be uh, doing anything. So that's really challenging because uh, in present, you can actually know that, but but it's really difficult at Zoom. But the important thing uh, for this workshop is Dominic said, this is affecting us. And that's true. This is affecting us as human beings because we don't know if we are getting them into the class and we don't know if they're uh, getting them with us uh, and that's really frustrating. And I share with, uh, with you that, that, that feeling of frustration. Thanks for, for sharing that. Um, okay, Maria said, uh, hello, Maria from, from Greece and the US. Uh, she said, not just being comfortable with teachers, but also with peers. Yeah, that's really true. That's really important. I agree as well, said Stacy. And the other Maria, Miralia from Italy as well, said, I, I was nothing that the most of us have the camera off in this moment, yeah. Yeah, that, that's, that's really normal, Maria. That, that's the new normality. But the important thing is, you know, to humanize the technology. Humanize the technology. How we can, use the, we can do that. 
And I, I believe this is a, a real safe space to, to, to think about it. And I think sharing these feelings is important to humanize technology and online classes. Okay, what else? What else um, is frustrating for you or you are feeling, or, or maybe instead you are you successful in another experience that you want to share? Um, when Santiago was talking, I like that. Um, the part when you were mentioning how you were helping plan the free time of the students. I think that's really important because sometimes I find myself like, okay, I just completed some assignments. I did a little bit earlier. So now what do I do? Like, I'm just like, uh, you know, so I think knowing what to do with your free time is important because otherwise you can waste your time with pointless things. And you know what is important about that, Lindsay? That maybe you you just um, finish your 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 uh, workshop, your work, uh, but you maybe spend I don't know like ten hours at your computer. And what are you gonna do? You're gonna be at uh, a social media. Uh, you're gonna be on your phone or on TV watching Netflix. No, let's do something different. Let's do recreation activities. Let's go to get some sunlight because we need sunlight, <laughs> do you remember that? So, uh, but maybe students don't think about that. And they just, uh, as Santiago said, they just um, stay at their, at their beds watching uh, their phones. So it's really important to give them options, N not, not obligation, but options. So they can, they can make some, because, you know, I, I was thinking about my time as a student, a high school student. Why, why did I do with all my free time? Just play soccer, <laughs> you know? I love soccer and I just go in that time, not now, but in that time, I just go out my house and there was a, a soccer game going on uh, all over the, my, my town and I can play in any one of, of that. But now this is different. So given this experience uh, of sunlight, of every, uh, you know, like, like healthy uh, options, it's really important in, in these uh, pandemic times. Well, uh, all the times, but in these pandemic times, it's crucial. So yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, and, and just, um, it is like, we need to be aware that we are um, in unity, you know? Uh, we cannot uh, like basically separate ourselves into pieces. We are one unity and um, there should be a balance in between our free time and our academic duties. Um, if we learn to balance that and to really take, a, take advantage of our free time, our performance in our academic duties is going to increase. Um, because our mind will be, will be healthier, um, our body would be um, ready, um, and it's like our motivation would be increased. So yeah. um, it's like we cannot divorce that. Uh, education is integral, you know? And, um, um, we need to merge all the aspects um, and not only for classes and not only for for um, for school period but also to apply it outside the institution to apply it where the real life happens you know like um, when we grow up when I mean how, how to we tra how to transmit it to others so uh, I think that's why this is um, a pretty uh, important and in, in, a, a key element in, in our personal development. And we can help yeah. our students. And yeah. also um, for us, as Julia said uh, in the chat, I run outside after all this screen time, even this conference. Yeah, that's true. For lunch, I just had to get outside. So uh, it's important also for us as human beings and Maria, thanks for, for sharing that. Uh, my daughter did not want to go out at all, sometimes even for a month, but I could not put more pressure on her. Yeah, because you're also mother and it's, it's frustrating as, as mother. Um, so thanks, Maria, because 
you know, this is another whole uh, workshop that we can make about this family and, and work stuff in, in at home. Well, it's, it's been mentioned all this conference. Yeah, that's really difficult. How, how to manage our kids at home in, 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 in this uh, online work, um, it's work smart. Well, we have just 20 seconds on tech you all. Uh, it's been wonderful experience. Thanks. Thank you right. so much. I just shared my my email address just in case okay. that um, if you want to contact me and to share more um, to share more ideas, just uh, feel free to write me.